The no. recording needs to start. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the sixth biennial Ken Ingram lecture. This lecture series honors the memory and life's work of Kenneth Ingram, a Jamaican librarian, administrator, bibliographer, scholar, and former Mona campus and UWI University librarian. I am Dr. Stanley Griffin, a deputy dean of our Faculty of Humanities and Education, and substantively a senior lecturer in archives and information studies in the Department of Library and Information Studies. And so I am pleased to serve as chair of today's gathering. This lecture follows a time-honored academic tradition that brings together a class, a, de a department, or a faculty, and better yet, a community to share and reflect on ideas and knowledge. Therefore, for an academic community, the lecture, especially today's lecture, is the hallmark of academic celebrations. When a new academic staff member is appointed, we have a lecture. When a new professor is elevated, we have a lecture. When a senior academic is retiring, we have a lecture. When there's a new discipline coming on stream, we have a lecture. And when we celebrate milestones, we come together for a lecture. So our lecture time today is twofold. We are celebrating 50 years of academic programming and service as a Department of Library and Information Studies, as well as remembering the stellar work and worth of a distinguished Jamaican scholar and gentleman, Kenneth Ingram. So we are grateful you are here to join us today. I now invite Dr. Rosemary Heath, the head of our department, to bring the welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good, after, good morning. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you all to this, or DLIS 50th anniversary, Ken Ingram lecture. Of course, you know that it is a very special moment because you will hear in a little while exactly who Ken Ingram was to the library and information profession. And we are delighted to have some specially invited guests amongst us as we celebrate this momentous occasion. We have with us the Chief Justice of Jamaica, Mr. Brian Sykes, and members of the Archives Advisory Committee, the President and members of CARBICA, the Jamaica Georgian Society, the Jamaican Archaeological Society, the Jamaica Historical Society, the Archival Education and Research Institute, the faculty, members of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, such as students and lecturers. We also have with us Dr. Paulette Carr, the UWI Mona Campus Librarian, as well as past Mona Campus librarians. We also have heads of department of um, past heads of department of the department of um, library information studies, retired and serving members of the Library and Information Association of Jamaica. And we also have students, both undergraduate and postgraduate students of the department. We welcome you warmly. We know that we have persons who are not associated with the profession, but who are well wishers. We also are very happy to have you. Each of you is special to us. And so we want to thank you for finding the time to be with us today. I'm going to hand over to um, Dr. Griffin, as he will take us through the rest of the program, and I will rejoin you at the end with a very special announcement. Thank you, Dr. Heath. I now call upon Professor James Robertson, a professor of history in the Department of History and Archaeology, to bring a remembrance of Ken Ingram. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what a daunting audience it is, and what a tribute to uh, someone I knew as a scholar and a colleague. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, and to talk about Kenneth Ingram, uh, 1931 to 2007. 
uh, a librarian in the real thing. As a newcomer to Jamaica's past, a historian of early modern Britain recruited to teach European history at Mona's very West Indian centered history program, I encountered Kenneth Ingram's scholarship in several ways. First, as someone who had worked on early 17th century London, I now sought to comprehend the urban past of an island where Port Royal reused street names from London. I learned from him. Like every historian who has encountered his volumes, I was impressed at Ingram, the scholar and bibliographer, uh, whose amazing catalogues, and they're still amazing, um, had locate and described surviving manuscript collections relating to West Indian history. These catalogues transformed historians' understanding of the evidence surviving from Jamaica's past. Evidence here, evidence in London, but evidence scattered across the globe. They allowed researchers to shift their viewpoints out beyond the view from the windows of King's House, where all too often there the were reports were written to, to fit the expectations of the colonial office back in London. Metropolitan scholars continue to burrow in the colonial office's massive files. West Indian historians will certainly rummage those files too, but with Ingram's guides, we can cast our nets far, far wider. Ingram's catalogues steer his readers to the surviving papers of traders or state administrators, alongside missionaries, military officers, botanists, other researchers, even occasional self-styled historians. Drawing on these testimonies, it's possible to try and write economic or social or even urban histories uh, of Jamaica that can move just a little bit closer to the perceptions of the wider cross-section of the people who were there, rather than recycling official platitudes. In making this transition, England's tenacious work tracking down the surviving sources that Jamaica's and British West Indies past was pathbreaking. <coughs> he provided the empirical base for three generations of scholarship that has investigated the experiences of a far wider cross-section of the people who lived on these islands than is available to historians of many other European empires or frontier societies. If, did not, if he had not had the vision to recognize the potential of this material and then the sheer tenacity to undertake the work that executing this project required, I doubt if many historians would have recognized just how narrow the foundations were of so much of the preceding colonial era scholarship. I remain impressed at the ways that Ingram's catalogues have continued to open new horizons for successive generations of researchers trying to find their way into the remarkable range of archives that hold material that can illuminate the experiences of people living here in the West Indies in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. That was one introduction, a bibliographical one, and I'm meeting him via his books. I met Mr. Ingram as a person off campus through the Jamaica Historical Society, which I joined soon after I arrived uh, at Mona. He had published articles in the Jamaican Historical Review, uh, I think he was in the Independence issue, and at the Society's Bulletin, and continued to edit the bulletin. In 2000, when I was first elected to the Jamaican Historical Society's Executive Committee, I was its newest recruit, while he was its longest serving member. Uh, now I'm the longest serving member. Uh, I recall his efforts to recruit copy for the bulletin, something that still remains a challenge. And our first conversation may have been a couple of years earlier when he has asked if I would consider offering a paper I just read to the society to the bulletin. At that juncture, the bulletin didn't publish illustrations, so society on creole architecture went elsewhere or study. Although his invitation continues to encourage me to write for the bulletin. Here I recall his courtesy after one of my first MA students had submitted on the old King's house in Spanish Town. I asked him about publishing her chapter on the fire that destroyed the old king's house in 1925. 
For the next month's executive committee meeting, I bought in an envelope with a printout and the disc of her vice chapter that the student had carefully polished and I'd gone over again too. He took it at once and it came out in the next issue, having benefited from one more careful edit. This was in 2000, so well after his retirement from Mona. But the practical and understated encouragement he continued to offer to those of us who are making our first starts in exploring Jamaica's past remains central to the way he worked. In this, and indeed in all his work, there was no grand standing. Instead, the evidence of his influence can be traced in the acknowledgments pages of a shelf of books and monographs, or in the growing range of archives that West Indian historians consulted or indeed in the expectation of excellence that the librarians at the University Libraries West Indies collection took for granted. Soon afterwards, he told the Jamaica Historical Society's executive committee that he was feeling tired and needed to hand over his editorship of the bulletin. I realized that this was a recognition that he was not immortal, so started investigating how someone might be recommended for an honorary degree. This is actually one of the few privileges that remain for professors at UWI. But asking my chair, I learned that as a lecturer, I could submit a proposal to my department. In starting to compile a dossier, I began at the University Archives, where not much was available other than live uh, retirement. Going back again later, you, you could find a lot more. And then proceeded to the West Indies collection in the, in the main library. Questions at the desk led to a conversation with the then West Indies Collection Librarian, where I explained the need for dossier. At that juncture, the University Library took over the project, and I saw another facet of his character in the respect and affection he'd earned from his fellow librarians, reflected in the precision with, when it, with which that proposal was prepared. Later in the semester, I was called into the librarian's office and showed a letter to be signed by the chairs of the departments of library studies and history, the retired professor of library studies and the retired and current professors of history. This draft omitted Vereen Shepherd, whose professorship was then newly granted, but that was quickly corrected. Afterwards, Professor Carl Campbell described as being called into the librarian's office, arriving and being asked to sign, which he did. The proposal then went out to an external referee where it found enthusiastic support and Kenny Finger received his honorary doctorate. This was announced just after I'd sent in the proof, uh, proofs for a review of his manuscript sources for the history of the West Indies uh, to slavery and abolition, the capstone of his work on West Indian manuscripts. I wrote to the editor asking if I could add a clause to my review to say that Dr. Ingram had just been awarded an honorary degree by the University of the West Indies. I thought it was a long shot. You can't add whole sentences to reviews at this stage. But the editors were Caribbeanists who knew his guides and my revision went in. Finally, I was able to see the respect that Jamaica's librarians held for Kenneth Ingram where, where he was a pioneer in earning his professional qualifications in librarianship and then work to develop the profession here. I was invited to attend a dinner at the senior common room held in his honor for his honorary doctorate. Luckily, I already had a suit and the moths had not got to it yet. It was a remarkable event that displayed the admiration and affection that Jamaican's librarians held for their Dr. Ingram. Three choirs of librarians sang, two of them choosing, you are the wind beneath my wings. He had worked hard to develop librarianship as a profession in Jamaica, and Kenneth Ingram's colleagues were pleased to seize this opportunity to acknowledge and celebrate his achievement. An impasse that this lecture series continues to demonstrate. They're right to do so. Very clear indeed. Thank you so very much, Professor. Just a quick program note and an acknowledgement. Let me acknowledge the presence of Ms. Oshin Jarrett. Your presentation is welcomed and will happen after the lecture. So thank you very much for your kind understanding and patience. I want now, it is now my privilege to introduce our distinguished lecturer this afternoon, Professor Jeanette Bastion. When the recently appointed first director of libraries and archives at the Smithsonian Institute, Tamar Evangelistia Doherty, 
was asked to name two great influences on her professional career, she responded, Mark A. Green, known for his collaborative work with Dennis Messner on the highly controversial, more product, less process archival processing methodology, and Jeanette Bastion, who, in her own words, was one of my professors at Simmons who taught me about collective memory in archives and bringing out marginal, marginalized voices in the collections we, care, we take care of. Our future presenter is a well-known, highly respected thought leader in archives and records theory, collective memory, decolonization, and community archives. Professor Bastion is a citizen of the Caribbean. Professor Bastion worked as a librarian in the United States Virgin Islands from 1972 to 1998, serving for the last 11 years as the director and territorial librarian with responsibility for the division of libraries, archives, and museums. Prof, therefore, is not only well acquainted with our region and its challenges, but also knew, and, no, knew the information professionals in the various territories intimately. Jeanette played a crucial role in the development of archival studies in the DLIS. In September 2013, she was a team leader of our group of experts comprising 10 archival professionals from North America and around the Caribbean, who not only recommended the introduction of the MA in archives and records management, but developed a detailed curriculum for the program. Indeed, the year before, on October 2012, Prof delivered the inaugural lecture in the Daphne Douglas lecture series for the DLIS. At that time, she reiterated her interest she, act, she had expressed several times before in hoping that the department will, since its inception in 1971, begin a program of training and education for archivists and records managers. As a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a Master of Philosophy in Literature, she no doubt has a special interest in the University of the West Indies. In addition to her involvement in the development of the curriculum for the archives program, and special mention must be made for her design of the popular interdisciplinary course, ARCM 6006, Memory and Record Keeping in the Caribbean. Jeanette has made an important contribution to archival education through her presentations and publications. She has thrown a new light on what constitutes archival materials in a post-colonial developing society in which, the, in which the oral traditions predominate and memory plays an important part. Her emphasis on the value of non-traditional records resonates well in a society in which the majority of its peoples left no written records. In fact, her articles such as a non-traditional archive in a post-colonial community, the recordness of carnival in the USVI, play mass, carnival in archives and the archives in carnival, and repatriation of the historical records of the USVI not only make a, con a major contribution to the body of archival literature, but also give solace and encouragement to archivists in, in, in our developing society, such as, you know, who cannot boast of centuries of traditional archival materials in their repositories. Moreover, her work serves as a key theoretical framework for the examination and appraisal of contemporary Caribbean cultural and memory keeping forms, which will inform archival practice in the region and broaden the research scope and content of our regional repositories in time to come. Her latest achievement, achievements, sorry, serving as a conceptualizer and lead editor of the 2018 publication, Decolonizing the Caribbean Record and Archives Reader is also very impressive. Not surprisingly, one that Tamar, the new Smithsonian director I referred to, is currently reading. It would not be an exaggeration to say that without her prestige in the archival community, her commitment and shared determination, this volume would not have been produced. Additionally, her editorial leadership of the forthcoming Archiving Caribbean Identity, Records, Community and Memory, will continue to spread her influence, not just on the definitions of Caribbean memory, but more importantly, the many new writers in the field, including four of the first graduates of the MA Archives and Records Management Program. I cannot forget to mention 
her influence being cemented in shaping the scholarship of a Caribbean information studies through her current stellar supervision of the first four MPhil and PhD candidates in our department. I am privileged to be the fly on the wall in those sessions. Now, over the last few weeks, according to Bob Marley, there is this natural mystic blowing through the air across, across our faculty of humanities. And if you listen carefully, now you will hear, because we as a faculty have been wrestling in our public lectures with our cultural distinctive and influences on our various disciplines. We have had public lectures in recent weeks on cultural anxieties in the literatures, the significance of the diaspora in shaping Caribbean linguistics. So today's lecture on oral traditions, archival records, and cultural knowledge is not just timely, but surely something for all of us in our faculty and definitely in our department to hear. Everyone, please greet and acknowledge Professor Jeanette Bastian. Thank you, Stanley, for that overwhelming introduction. And I certainly hope I can live up to it. Um, so I'm hoping that there'll be time for questions after my presentation. Please put any questions you have in the chat and Stanley, I think, has offered to monitor them. To avoid interruptions during the lecture, I'm going to share my screen now even though I won't actually be presenting slides until later on in the lecture. So I'm gonna just share the screen now. It is indeed an honor to present the annual Kenneth Ingram lecture. I first met Mr. Ingram in the early 1970s at an Acuril conference. At the time, I was a very new and very young librarian living and working in St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands, where I still live today. And I was very much in awe of the director of the University of the West Indies Libraries. Several years later, when I came to Mona to pursue an MPhil at UE, Mr. Ingram very kindly gave me a summer job in the library, filling in for librarians on vacation. It was a generous offer, much needed, very much appreciated, and typical of his gracious and thoughtful approach. Kenneth Ingram demonstrated the best qualities of scholarly librarianship with the focus on the importance of Caribbean knowledge. And it is truly an honor to give this lecture in his name. My presentation today centers around the recasting and reshaping of what we traditionally think of as archival records to reflect and embrace the oral traditions and cultural expressions that define many communities and nations, both those within the Caribbean and globally. Mention archival records and the images and words we often conjure up are textual, old, dusty, historical, governmental, often colonial. I am suggesting a different perspective. Reconsidering what forms and formats records and archives might take in primarily non-Western cultures is not meant as a rejection of traditional Western models, but rather is an advocacy for an expansion and amplification of those models towards a broader and more inclusive recognition of what archives are and what they could be. But before delving into this, it has become customary of late for presenters to proclaim their own positionality who they are and where they are coming from. In that spirit, I'd like to invite you to briefly follow my own archival part, path towards thinking about the relationships between oral traditions, archival records, and cultural knowledge. I was born in the UK and immigrated to the United States with my family as a teenager. 
following my completion of a bachelor's degree at New York University and a master's in a library science program. I moved to St. Thomas Virgin Islands, working for several years as a librarian in the College of the Virgin Islands, now a university, and for over 25 years in the Virgin Islands public library system. In between, I traveled to Jamaica for a year and studied at UWE towards an MPhil in Caribbean literature with professors Eddie Bohr and Mervyn Morris, and where my exposure to the literature of such authors as Roger Mace, Earl Lovelace, and George Lamming gave me insights into the values and concerns of the Caribbean region that have inspired me throughout my writing and teaching career. One issue that continually puzzled me in the Virgin Islands library system was the absence, the lack of any historical archival records or any archives at all. Patrons seeking information about a wide range of historical and genealogical matters were told that the archival records were all in Denmark at the Danish National Archives in Copenhagen. As you may know, Denmark colonized the, Vir the Danish West Indies, today Virgin Islands, in the 1700s as part of the European land grab and exploitation of the Caribbean. Enslaved laborers worked on the sugar plantations, primarily in St. Croix and St. John, until emancipation was won by the enslaved themselves in 1848. The islands were sold in 1917. The islands were sold to the United States and renamed the US Virgin Islands. At the time of the sale, Denmark shipped most of the colonial records created in the Virgin Islands to the Danish National Archives, where they still reside. So while special collections at the libraries had many books about the Virgin Islands, we had very little original material. I took this concern with me when eventually I went to study for a PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. I wanted to know why these records created in the Virgin Islands were claimed by the colonizing country rather than remaining where they were created. Inevitably, this question a very familiar story in the Caribbean, as I'm sure everyone here knows, led to one that may be equally important. Without access to their historical records, how did Virgin Islanders understand their own history, form their collective memories and construct their identity? After much research, many oral interviews and my own personal reflections, I realized that the answer to that question lay at least in part in the strength of the oral tradition, the folkways, the celebrations, the legends, the landscape, the music and the stories that Virgin Islanders carried with them, passing them on through generations but also continually adding to them. These oral traditions are the archives, fully as much and perhaps even more than those distant colonial records. With that brief background, let me really be finally begin this lecture by painting a short scenario that I hope will further illustrate what I am talking about. In June 1990, representatives of the Republic of Senegal and the territory of the Virgin Islands met on the mall in Washington, DC. The Washington Mall is a landscaped park and national space at the heart of the city and is designed for public events, both official and informal. The representatives from Senegal and the Virgin Islands were participants in the Smithsonian Institution's annual Summer Folklife Festival, 
organized and presented by its Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. The two week long festival featured a broad array of cultural activities from both Senegal and the Virgin Islands. Artisans, storytellers, musicians, cooks, dancers, and performers from both regions celebrated and shared their traditions. The Smithsonian Folk Life Festival itself had already become a tradition, started in 1967 as an international exposition of living cultural heritage. This ongoing annual event continues today to showcase a wide variety of cultures and traditions from around the world and across the United States. During the course of the two week exposition, Senegalese and Virgin Islanders discovered many points of symbiosis between their two regions. Similarities in dance, food, music, and oral traditions were sources of mutual discovery and delight. But in addition to a common African heritage, there were also other similarities, why not, while not overtly on display, that bound these two regions together. Both regions had been former colonies, one of France and one of Denmark, and both shared a history of exploitation and violence through the tragedies of the slave trade. Significantly, both cultures also relied on a blend of intangible and tangible cultural heritage for remembering and conveying their pasts, as well as conducting their presence. The mediums of transmission were primarily oral, musical, and performative, sharing a deep and intertwined genealogy and history. The coming together of these two related cultures was a source of knowledge and affirmation for both. Celebrating cultural her heritage, cultural transference, and the ongoing living reality of dynamic cultural evolution and change. So much so that this event inaugurated an annual local folk life festival in the Virgin Islands with Senegal participating in the first festival held on the island of St. Croix in 1992. But what if these and similar celebrations open a wider window into even more complex relationships? What if these intangible living cultural traditions, finally recognized as such by UNESCO in 2003, also function as the dynamic records of communities and as the archives of their evolving history, expressed not only through text, but orally, musically, performatively, artifactually. And if that were the case, what then would archivists, librarians, historians, and societies generally need to recognize and understand about cultural expressions and about records themselves, about their diverse forms, about their relationship to the communities that create and utilize them, in order to place those expressions equally alongside those primarily textual ones that we traditionally label as archives. And if these expressions are as valid and legitimate records as any text-based representations, then how would these archivists, librarians, and others need to rethink and reinterpret traditional understandings of archival records, records creation, and record keeping in order to fully embrace them? This Smithsonian vignette of cultural recognition and community empowerment between the Virgin Islands and Senegal illustrates the story that I wish to tell here. Part of a wider narrative of expansion, equity, and inclusion in the archives. 
communities and societies throughout the world express and document their heritage and cultures through a wide variety of tangible and intangible forms and formats, including but not limited to oral traditions, performative arts, festivals, commemorations, materiality, and monuments, often not recognized as records in the traditional Western sense. These dynamic expressions, in fact, form the legitimate archives of a community and are critical components of documenting those communities and societies. In the 21st century, it has become increasingly clear that traditional Western archival models have proven inadequate to accommodate the varieties of memories and records that exist in a global society. New models are needed to meet the needs as well as the demands of international post-colonial and decolonial environments. I hypothesize such a model as a cultural archives, a recognition of archives that considers equally both intangible cultural expression and tangible documentation as records and asks how they can be legitimately and seamlessly integrated within an, ar an archive. Most importantly, what kind of framework will accommodate these cultural expressions, often manifested in formats that are not generally recognized as archival? How to interweave tangible and, tan and intangible cultural knowledge the archives as well as the repertoire, the written as well as the performative. This is the challenge for information professionals. Can material tangible archival tradition also be an appropriate for non-material intangible expression? I argue that the trajectory of archives from rock art to digital bits strongly suggests that the making and keeping of records and archives conforms to no tradition other than the human need to communicate, to record, to remember, and in both a positive and a negative sense, to control one's environment. In the 21st century, as formerly colonized people and nations assert their right to that control for their own cultures and identities. It seems clear that in order for the archives to be globally accepted places of memory and accountability, they must recognize and embrace the multiple ways, both tangible and intangible, textual and oral, fixed and dynamic, in which societies document themselves. All cultures are archiving cultures. That is, every culture creates and perpetuates its own strategies for maintaining and passing on its history and its memory, for bearing evidence and for holding its community accountable. We can call these strategies traditions, heritage or expression, or we can call them records and archives. The making and keeping of records has an ancient history. While some historians and archeologists credit the making of records with the invention of writing, others point to petroglyphs, rock art, and the use of a variety of objects as markers to document events. Jamaican archeologist Ivor Connolly, for example, writes that pictograms, that is drawings of a swimming turtle, a bird in flight, a crawling iguana, a glaring owl, a cautious coney, a kakit's staff, may be seen as a descriptive record of items of the early people's physical inventory. But it is more than that. Petroglyphs 
that is incisions or engravings on cave, cave walls may also be seen as a record of a personal spiritual journey. Through these drawings, engravings and sculptures, the early ethnic groups have shared with us a story of their religion, their hierarchy, their division of labor and their political structure. And while historians of archival development often identify the clay tablets of the Assyrians in 2100 BC as the earliest efforts at record making and keeping, the rock art of the indigenous peoples in Australia, the Caribbean and around the world has been dated thousands of years earlier. Through the centuries, and particularly as society moved from orality to literacy, the keeping of records became a central administrative activity for governments, for policymaking, for evidence, but primarily for bureaucratic control. During the centuries of European colonization, record keeping practices became the tools of the colonizers not only for claiming territorial possessions and creating boundaries, but for control and oppression of populations. In the general scramble for territory, many of these so-called possessions suffered a succession of so-called owners. But regardless of who was in charge, records and archives were central to the colonial enterprise. And from the beginning, Archives and records were deeply implicated in the colonization, colonization process. Maps defined boundaries and redrew territories. Written laws, policies, and regulations proclaimed from central offices controlled distant populations. Records categorized people and property, and tragically designated people as property. Significantly, while colonial officers used records to administer their possessions, colonizers and settlers also brought their textual record keeping practices with them. Eurocentric recording and record keeping was imposed upon peoples who had already developed their own archiving traditions, although generally less textual and more oral as the colonizers devalued the indigenous inhabitants, the enslaved and the indentured. They also devalued the cultures of those peoples, including their expressions and record keeping traditions. The European colonizers imposed their own record keeping practices upon populations that had formerly flourished with different traditions. By the mid 19th and early 20th centuries, Western archivists and record keepers were consolidating and encoding centuries, if not millennia of archival practice into manuals that hugely influenced the archival protocols of their times and have continued to dictate and influence practice today. From these centuries of archival practice and from their codification, several fundamental principle, archival principles emerged, which apply equally to all forms and formats of record, the textual as well as the digital, the oral as well as the performative. And I'd like to briefly discuss just two of these principles, provenance and custody, that are relevant to the discussion today. Provenance, the foundational archival principle essentially refers to the arranging and organizing of records by their creator. The creator can be a person, a family, a branch of government, or the organization that created the records. In a wider sense, provenance also refers to the context of creation, the community, the location, the institution, and even the family in which the records were created. 
Importantly, the, rec the community itself can be the creator in what is being increasingly recognized as societal provenance. Knowing where and by whom the records were created is critical to understanding what they are about. Locating them within specific contexts connects them to the actual events that they reflect. Without context, without that relationship, records become useless piles of paper or random collections of electronic bits. Custody refers to the succession of government offices, families, or persons who own or control a collection of records from the moment they are created. For legal evidence, whether it is a land claim or a lawsuit, being able to demonstrate an unbroken chain of custody or ownership is critical to establish the integrity and authenticity of a particular group of records. Both provenance and custody affect the ways in which archives are described and accessed. For example, records about colonized may be described and organized within the context of the colonial office that created the records. But those same records may be described quite differently if they were placed within the context of the formerly colonized peoples who were the subjects of the records. To a great extent then, provenance defines the context and the context dictates how a record is described and organized. While custody not only indicates a particular context, but affects how and by whom the record is presented and accessed. It is worth noting here that the concept of a record itself is fluid. Archivists have spent many words and a great deal of thought on the question of defining the record. Archival theorist, the late Terry Cook in 1982 offered a succinct and compelling argument for record making as a universal and enduring activity. Writing that behind the record always lies the need to record, to bear evidence, to hold and be held accountable, to create and maintain memory. The need to record is not tied to any specific form or format. Wax tablets, papyrus, parchment, stone engravings, paper, film, computer bits, as well as memory sticks, rock art, dance, songs, stories, celebrations, and quilts are only some of the myriad configurations that testify to the human desire and need to record. Archives and records, provenance and custody are all about context and relationships, but it is up to the community or the nation to determine what constitutes a record within their own specific and particular context. And it's equally important to recognize that who owns the record also controls the story. Rethinking what an archive could be, both in format as well as content, seems particularly applicable to the Caribbean, where oral traditions are nurtured and flourish, cultural knowledge abounds, and is intimately connected to the people. I would like to give a few examples of what I mean by cultural archives taken from the book of essays mentioned by Stanley and about to be published in June of this year. It's edited by myself, John Ahrens and Stanley. This book, Archiving Car Caribbean Identity, resulted from a conference held in November, 2019 at Mona called Unlocking Caribbean Memory, Uncovering New Archives, Discovering New Records. 
Of the 15 essays in the book, eight focus on new archival constructs, while seven focus on Caribbeanizing traditional ones. In common, all the authors were intent on rejecting colonial models, discovering new models, and finding a new way. And of course, this is as true of records and archives as for many other aspects of Caribbean life. So some examples of this new way include, let's see, landscape as archives. In this instance, the Antigua Recreation Ground in St. John's Antigua. Initially a whites only cricket ground for British colonizers in the 19th century, eventually the site of World Cup cricket, including some of the most famous cricketers in the Caribbean and in the world. Today, it is the center for carnivals and other community activities, and importantly, the site where Antigua celebrated its independence. Author of the article, Stephen Butters, notes that, quote, the symbolic representation of the landscape, which was once seen as a hegemonic bastion and stood as a trophy for white social or order and recreational pride, has been replaced by the once marginalized and underrepresented. This living ecosystem, which started as the Antigua Cricket Club ground in 1865, continues today as the Antigua Recreation Ground. The interconnection of archives and place, where the physical proof of movement and location intimately links the landscape and the people who inhabit it, suggests that the community and cultural memory should be a counterpoint to the colonial records found in the Antigua and Barbuda National Archives. performance as archival. In this instance, dance theater in Barbados, dance as an intangible cultural expression where the archive is, in, is embodied within the dancers themselves. Author John Hunt notes that here, dance serves as an archive. Within the processes of dance training, and the choreographic repertoire are past and present constructions of identity. When presented, these productions reanimate and reflect these specific dynamics. Beyond being considered a historical document, an analysis of dance can reflect a storehouse of relationships that intersect in time and space. Music. In this instance, the programs of the UE Christmas Festival of the Nine Lessons with Carols, where from its traditional European beginnings, the music gradually evolved to reflect Caribbean rhythms and language. The author Sean Wright observes, over the years, the festival has been Caribbeanized as selections have changed from traditional European carols to songs of a more Caribbean flavor. The archival programs and recordings demonstrate these changes, which began in the 1960s and 1970s, the watershed period for independence and other post-colonial revolutions in the Anglophone Caribbean. Carnival and Calypso, in this instance, Soka in Trinidad, and how one particular song, Savannah Grass by Kess the Band, became a record of the carnival experience itself. Author Kai Barrett writes, cultural expressions in a post-colonial context are often manifestations of reshaping aspects of a cruel and unforgiving past. In the Caribbean, this past was marred by an anti-African sentiment that did not value the practices and beliefs of enslaved people. 
the Van Grass poetically captures the complicated process of reassembling these pieces in a contentious socio-cultural atmosphere. Soka tells stories, induces reminiscence, and attempts to assemble the fragments of self-identity. It can evoke a sense of time, place, and emotion, especially when the song is repeatedly heard, reinforcing collective memory. Cultural expressions like Soka document tradition as much as written records do. Significantly, several authors also discuss the repurposing of written records, records that once supported a colonial administration, but can be turned on their head to foster support and teach about local traditions and local history. For example, James Robertson discusses critical omissions in the archives, in this instance, telegrams, created by treating some records as ephemera. He asks, how long should official files be assessed as simply the memory of a particular department? And when will they be considered as potential resources for the memory of a nation? In such forthcoming discussions too, our case of the missing telegrams in colonial era Jamaica suggests that opportunities will occur in selecting what to archive for the records of an ambitious independent nation with further issues arising when it comes to curating its born digital data. We can hope that potential uses for new materials may yet be recognized. Seeking to imagine the archival possibilities for some of Jamaica's and other Caribbean nations, current records is an opportunity worth seizing. At this point, the librarians and archivists in the audience may be thinking, yes, this is all well and good. Of course, we support intangible cultural expressions. Of course, we support oral traditions, but how can they be described, preserved and made accessible? We, all of us in the 21st century are extremely fortunate to be living in a digital age where the possibilities for linking, illuminating, highlighting, showcasing, showcasing, and creating access to both tangible and intangible records can go as far as our imagination will take us. The online Jamaica Memory Bank, for example, has been exploring these possibilities for some time with its cultural map of Jamaica and snapshots and videos of a wide variety of types of intangible culture. In Trinidad, numerous venues in both museums and on websites celebrate all aspects of carnival. Barbados launched an intangible cultural heritage committee earlier this year. But I am advocating something slightly different. I am advocating that oral traditions and intangible cultural heritage not be siloed and treated by libraries and archives as separate types of information and cultural heritage, but combined and connected as full knowledge partners within an integrated information system, within integrated information systems. That folk tales receive the same attention and archival respect as manuscripts, that traditional dances be described as embodied archives on an equal footing with the more tangible performance documentation, that calypsos and music generally be understood as records that mirror the society that is creating them fully on a par with the government reports that also reflect that same society. That carnivals and similar national celebrations are as described and illustrated as the most complex institutional report. That all, all these cultural expressions are seen both as viable records 
and as the living archives of the society. In conclusion, I would like to return to the question posed at the outset of this lecture. The relationship between the loss of historical colonial records and the ability of the community to build its collective memory and construct its identity. And to that question, I would like to offer a story, a personal experience that happened to me a few years ago. And just a note, the central person in this experience, my mother-in-law, Augusta, passed away at the age of 101, two years ago. At the time of this incident, she was 98. It is a warm and sunny St. Thomas Sunday afternoon in June. And I am sitting on Augusta's porch. Augusta is my 98 year old mother-in-law. Originally born on the island of St. John, she has lived in St. Thomas for most of her very long life. She traces her St. Jonian family back many generations to when they were servants on a large St. John estate. Many of Augusta's children and their children's children live on St. Thomas and every Sunday afternoon after church, various members of this extended family gather on her porch. They bring food and share a meal together. They play dominoes, a game at which Augusta excels and often wins to the great chagrin of her younger partners. This Sunday, I am privileged to be part of the gathering, an assortment of aunts, uncles, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, including Augusta's 98-year-old cousin. The conversation swirls around and around, as casual family meetings do, touching on many topics, until it finally focuses in on the spelling of a family name, Dalmida. Is it an I or a Y or an E or an A? Why do some members of the family from nearby islands or from different generations spell that name differently? Other family names are thrown into the mix for this, this really is a very large family. Several theories are broached, some rejected. No one really knows the answer. No one knows for sure. Suddenly, one of the family calls out, maybe the answer is in those old Danish records in the archives. Everyone knows what she means. It's common knowledge that the Danes took their colonial records with them when they sold the islands to the Americans and left in 1917. That possibility is seriously considered and discussed. It may be so, but then rejected. Because, as everyone also knows, those records are in Denmark, or possibly locked up somewhere in the Virgin Islands, certainly locked up in an archives somewhere. There is general agreement among the group that even if there is some information in those records, there is no way to find out. Those Danish records created in the then colony of St. Thomas are not easily accessible. A brief regret, but the conversation moves on. If the records aren't accessible, maybe they don't really matter anyway. What we know and what we tell one another may be what matters and may be enough. And so is it ever really possible to decolonize the archives? Is it possible to completely break with archival tradition or does the successful decolonized society recraft the archives, turn the tradition inside out, demand that colonial tradition give way to decolonization? But while that's easy to say about ephemeral issues like the spelling of a name, it may be much more difficult when those records contain critical information about your family and your community. For me, this story illustrates several points. 
the recognition that records or the lack of records is a very personal matter. The recognition that for formerly colonized people, the shadow of the colonizer may never quite go away. That shadow can be slight, can be looming, or could even be benign or nostalgic, yet it is likely present in some form. But that in spite of records or the absence of records, communities can and will choose how they wish to remember. People understand their own history in their own way, and they create their own cultural knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Prof. Um, folks, I don't know, but there is this reaction feature there that I think she needs a virtual round of applause from all of us. That was solid. I think, you know, um, you've uh, you've laid a foundation for lots of us, lots of discussions. I mean, every archival society, every society has its own archives. And quite frankly, every tradition, every way of remembering is a valid source and resource for information. So the floor is open virtually, of course, for questions. Professor will, you know, field some questions. And um, <laughs> Jeanette, you've given us lots to think about. So your thoughts on the veranda as a meeting point and as a discussion point. I think um, from, I, let's start there, where for many of us, we are familiar with the ways in which our community interacts and shares information. So how do you think, um, how can we box it and put that on a shelf? You're, you're still open. So, so is this a question for me or is this a question for everybody? Well, it's a question for everyone. I think that we're all thinking about, I mean, all that detail you gave us, but I think it's also a starting point for you. Um, because at the end of the day, while we are recognizing that, yes, there is this memory, there is this information, there is this content living and right around us, how do we make it accessible? Oh, I, I, well, I mean, you know, I think I mentioned, obviously, that is always the question. And it's always the, the, what, the thing that people always say when you talk about intangible cultural heritage, they always say, oh, but you can't preserve it, you can't save it, you can't do this with it. Um, but I would like to suggest that we're, as I mentioned, we're very fortunate right now, because we have the ability to do amazing things. And I think if you, if you look on the web, if you look on the internet, if you think about digitization, there are ways to make connections. There are ways to show, to show records in many, many different ways. I mean, not just three-dimensional, but you can show videos. I mean, it kind of goes on and on. But more than that, you can also connect things. You can link them up in ways that you couldn't link up before. So for example, I mean, take an obvious huge celebration like a carnival. You could have the documentary items, the brochures, the flyers, all the information that's written, but you can also link to all the activities that may be going on to the Calypso tents, to people, making costumes to the parades themselves so that you can take both the textual and what we might call the oral or the intangible or the performative and you can make i mean it will never be a complete whole it's never you're never going to duplicate or replicate the actual event but i think you can come a lot closer and you can bring in those oral elements that in the end tend to be more important to the people and to the society than the written ones. So that is my answer. I haven't tried it out, but at the same time, I have seen things. I have seen experiments that people and different 
institutions have been making. And, and I think that realizing that, that we, we are not really documenting all of society, that, that's the basic challenge. Absolutely. Um, so I see a question in the chat. Um, considering that the language of the archives was colonial, can making it accessible and or inclusive until we have to re-describe or and or add subjects in local languages. Would that be professionally acceptable? I think that that's a really good question. And I think that there are many places like Australia, for example, where they have a large indigenous community or New Zealand in particular, where they have, I think, really worked at integrating their indigenous archives with their traditional set with their settler archives that I think that process is ongoing. There's nothing sacred about Jenkinson. I think that's the and those for those who don't know Jenkinson was one of those um, early 20th century manual writers that kind of set the tone and um, told everybody what they should be doing in terms of records. But there's nothing sacred about him. There's nothing sacred about Schellenberg. There's nothing sacred about all those writers of the manual. The manual is yours to write. What works in your society? If you are in New Zealand and you have a large Maori population that, had, that has their own need for their own histories, then you have to then incorporate them. If you want to include them in your society, they have to become part of your documentation in whatever form that documentation is. So I would say it's wide open. And I definitely think that I know in the United States and in England, in those countries that have been settler and colonial countries, Canada as well, there was a lot of discussion going on among archivists who finally realized that they've left a whole group of people out and, you know, and they're figuring out and they can only include them in the language and the cultures of those people. They can't just take their own language and impose it. So I think that there's huge amounts of changes going on. And when I said that the model, the the old models were not working. I really meant it. And I think that this is supported a lot by what is happening in, in many countries. Absolutely. Thank you so much, folks. You're encouraged to raise your hand and voice your question. Roma, Roma from Trinidad and Tobago, please. Yes, good afternoon all. Good, a special good afternoon to Professor. Um, thank you as usual for your very informative and, and um, very thorough presentation. And thank you also for advocating for our archiving of our traditions and our own way of community record keeping. Um, I just would like to advocate and support you in, in documenting that, um, that traditional, the traditions, the intangible heritage by use of audiovisual recordings. This is not a very popular form that the entire Caribbean have not been really um, pursuing because perhaps the lack of the equipment to digitize the old formats, et cetera. But I want to support that. And I will give the example of Trinidad and Tobago where we had state media for 30 years in Trinidad and Tobago, and we do have a very large collection from our government media, which we are trying to digitize. But they have also, in addition to capturing the governance issues with the prime ministers and the speeches, the, the formal part, we have a lot of our indigenous cultural forms. So for instance, Dr. Eric Williams, when we became independent, he went on these media people tours. And each time he visited a village, he was so enthralled with the culture that he saw. So he formed the best village competition. So we have a lot of tapes that represent all the different 
different cultural forms from all over Trinidad. That's a rich resource that we can tap into. Later on, there were different cultural programs that we have recordings of. So at least we have that, and we also have radio, at least with the government perspective. And there's also another community television, Banyan, I'm sure you all would have heard of it, um, who took the lead in developing cultural programming, local cultural programming. And that's an excellent archive as well. We have actually his DVD collection here, the National Archives. But we have been through documenting and collecting the audiovisual resources, at least ensuring that the intangible is captured. In terms of repurposing the colonial, um, what I want to suggest, what we have been doing, um, so in terms of archiving the audiovisual collections, I have found it necessary for the to get the institutional memory of the history of that whole government media, starting from colonial times moving forward. And I have some key people I need to interview to document that history. So the provenance will be there, uh, captured in the description of those audiovisual records. So I think the oral history is critical to documenting. And of course, right now we are losing so much of our icons right now. It's so necessary. It's a race against time to really do that. So I know Bui also has had a program. I see Lauren is here. They have um, recorded, and I think Nalis as well has been doing some oral history recording. So I think we just need to what? recognize <laughs> recognize our value and who we are because we really are unique and I support professor that we have to develop our own model the rest of the world I mean I remember when Stanley and I were Roma. doing our studies at Scotland Roma. we needed our new model so yeah. I support that yes that. it, it has to come course. from the Caribbean yes absolutely um thanks for you know always very passionate and yeah um, there's some comments, but I want to take Meluli, hopefully I've pronounced your name correctly, quickly. That's, uh... Oh, yes. Um, thank you, uh, Chairperson Coordinator. Um, thank you, Professor, for that um, insightful um, presentation or lecture. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, let me go straight to the question that I have uh, for the Professor there. Um, I was um, interested in uh, the issue of provenance um, um, in the context of um, uh, the colonizers versus uh, the colonized. Um, you spoke about um, records that have been separated or taken away from their provenance. Um, in the case of, um, for instance, Senegal, in the case of um, the Virgin Islands, and I think it's a phenomenon which cuts across um, the globe, including the US um, and many other countries. Uh, but the bone of contention perhaps is um, uh, where do you draw a line um, in terms of who the actual provenance is? Because on one hand, the colonizers will say we are the provenance, we created these records. At the same time, the, the, the context um, in which they were created, um, who are the colonized in this particular case, are also entitled to the same. So at the end of the day, we have um, this contestation in terms of where the boundary is, who exactly is the provenance, um, how would you best advise there? And then the last one is, um, uh, could there be a permanent, uh, are you foreseeing a permanent uh, solution to this um, problem of archives of records that have been taken away from their provenance, thereby stripping them of their meaning? Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that question. Yes, this is a global problem. Many, many countries are involved um, because, I mean, one thing that I will say really amazed me when I started, and this is kind of an aside, but I started to, I, since I was writing about colonizing and colon, I wanted to see how much of the world was colonized. And it's actually, amazing, huge, a huge percentage of countries of the world were colonized by this small group of nations. And so this business of records is, is, is a continuing one. And, um, and actually there have been several um, books written about this one called Displaced Archives, which talked and several conferences 
The um, International Council on Archives has now a special committee on displaced archives and the exact problems that you talked about. So are these archives really shared? Should they be shared? Because it kind of, as you might say, the provenance, the creation comes from both sides. But, in, but I would like to say that in a, and, and many countries I think have, that particularly are reluctant to um, give up their archives, talk about sharing the archives. Um, one way to share them, of course, is by digitizing them. Mm -hmm. And I just, if you don't mind, just want to give one example of how digitization, while it sounds great and everybody's sharing everything, is problematic. So um, today, by the way, in the Virgin Islands is uh, March 31st is transfer day. And transfer day is the day that the, um, the United States, trans the Virgin Islands was transferred from a colonial, a colony in Denmark to a colony of the United States. And, it's, and, and in 2017 was the 100th anniversary of this transfer. And so because this business of who owns these records and why do people have to, you know, travel to Denmark to look at them has been contentious for a long, long time. The Danish National Archives decided as a gift that they would digitize their archives, which are considerable. I mean, there's, I don't know how many thousands, hundreds, maybe as much as thousands of, of, um, of cubic feet we're talking about, but it's a lot of material, over 200 years worth of records. And so they digitized them and they created a website. The problem with the website is that it was digitized by the Danish archivists, by the Danish archival standards, in terms of the way the colonial offices were set up, using the names or whatever they could find, which are, in other words, the people, the Virgin Islanders were not involved in the digitization process. And so it's very difficult to search those archives. It's very difficult, for example, to search names because people are listed under a wide variety of names. It could be the names they were called where they were enslaved on a plantation, or it could be the name, their, their surname, which would not be there and so forth. So, so that this sharing and this digitization is probably a solution or some kind of a solution to, to the sharing question. But I would suggest, and it's, and I'm not, and I don't think I'm alone in saying this, people have started to fuss and write articles and to realize these are the problems. But it only works if the process itself is a shared process. And the people from the colonized country take part as equal partners in determining how the digitization goes. I think that the question you raise about the provenance, and I know that many Caribbean countries, um, particularly, I forgot what date it was that all of these Caribbean records were discovered, not in the British records office, but in the Commonwealth office somewhere in London. And I've never, and they were not just the records from the Caribbean, there were records from countries in, from African countries, mm -hmm. and they have never been returned. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like they'll ever be returned. So in a way, there's no answer to the question because <laughs> there's no, um, it's very, there's no way of saying, yes, it belongs to this side or yes, it belongs to this side. Because on the one hand, you have the creators, and on the other hand, you have the content. And, and these are not the same. And yet both, have an equal right. So I'm sorry, I cannot solve that problem for you. <laughs> but I will say that this problem is shared by many, many people throughout the world. 
Stanley, I don't know if you have anything to add on this. It's a migrated archives issue. And quite frankly, you, you said it correctly. While the, while the description and the organization and the details therein were created by the creator, the colonizer, the, the meanings and the context and how you how you interpret and you know use is totally different and articulated differently by the colonized. And so you're right. I can't search it using my ways of thinking about it, and you are imposing your way of organizing and accessing the materials. So we have an international audience, and I want to welcome those from outside of the region who are with us. Um, so, and I have some questions here from Sin. And please forgive me, I'm horrible with names. Sindiso Bebe. The more we try to decolonize the archives, the more we move closer to a libraries, archives, museums, Trinity. Hopefully, I mean that's what you mean, concept. So, what are your views on that? Um, and let me go on to the other one. So, the first one is about this. Well, I don't want to say convergence because you know it sounds it has bad connotations for those who have been marginalized or you know sub subjected in the information sector. Um, but that trinity of libraries, archives, and museums. And then we have from Thailand, Superwit Bodhisuan, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Hi from Thailand, I am an amateur archivist. I don't know, I don't have a degree, that's no worries. I will ask, I would like to ask the Madam Keynote, what is your suggestion for increasing generation engagement toward, I'm so sorry, I'm not reading correctly, toward, the best solution to making community archives sustainable. I'm sorry, I don't know if that's correct. And if there is no financial support from government, what's the best solution? So yeah, over to you. Uh, okay, so two challenges here. Um, as far as the land, the libraries, archives and museums go, um, I would say there's pluses and minuses. Um, and actually I have, written about this. So um, I have thought about it. And I also have with some friends, with some two colleagues written a book called Libraries in Archives, I mean, Archives in Libraries, which kind of talks about this dissonance between how librarians think of things and how archivists think of things and how difficult that is for an archives that's in a library. And I think that many, and this is, of course is, common for many, many archives. I, I worry with the, and I will use that word convergence, Stanley, I worry with the convergence of libraries, archives, and museums that archives would basically get the short end of the stick for several reasons. Number one, I think, is there usually are many more librarians than there are archivists. So you may have if you're lucky, you may have two or three archivists, but you may have 25 librarians in the institution. And the whole philosophy of why you keep archives is quite different from why you keep, why you serve in libraries. Because in libraries, and you might connect, collect, connect correct me because I was a librarian quite a long time ago, but from what I, I think is that libraries are all about service. Mm -hmm. It's service to the public, service to the university, service to wherever, to your institution. Whether that institution is the whole community or whether that institution is an academic one. Although archivists like to also do reference, also serve, that's not their primary mission. The primary mission is the preservation mm -hmm. of the materials. Mm -hmm. Because archival materials might be useful for historians, but what they are really kept for is as evidence. Evidence that something happened. Evidence of an action. Evidence of a memory. Mm -hmm. they, so they have a historical function, but they also have a very, very practical function. So, for example, when there is a scandal in the government, and if the archives manages to archive the emails, and of course this has happened a lot in the United States, then you follow the trail of the records, you follow the trail of the archives, and you figure out 
what really happened. And so archives hold people and particularly government accountable. So, so, there, so one of the issues I think is the different missions. But at the same time, I do think that because, and particularly because of digitization, that there are many ways, many ways to share, many ways to cross over, many, many ways to cooperate and work together. I guess I always feel that archivists though, always have to be careful that they don't get taken over. But that's, you know, my personal bias as an archivist. But I think that finding ways to cooperate while retaining your own core missions may be the way to go. Um, I know, for example, that in Canada, they have now become Libraries Archives Canada. And they were a separate National Archives of Canada and they had a separate National Library. Politicians decided, oh, well, these are so similar, we've got to bring them together. And that's probably what many of you hear from politicians. Oh, it sounds the same. So why are we wasting all this money having two different institutions? But it hasn't actually worked out very well from what I understand that the, um, the library predominates. And so I think that you have to walk carefully, but also I think there are many, a great many advanced cultural and information advantages to pooling, to putting this information together and make it, and so that the people accessing it, the people looking at it can see one thing, one holistic website that in the back end, may be comprised of several different institutions cooperating. So that's, that's what I think. And so the second question, which is about how do you sustain or begin a community archives? Is that sort of the question? Yes, and how do you get the young involved? Ah, uh, well, I can only give you some, some ideas, but they may not be. I think you get the young involved by including within your archives or your library, things that they themselves can relate to. Um, I recall quite a few years ago, I actually um, co-edited a book on community archives. And one of, and it was at the time, was quite early in the development. And so at the time, nobody was quite sure what a community archives was, but it sort of sounded like a good thing. And, and so I got, managed to get essays from people from many, many countries. And one of the countries was Fiji. And they, in, in this their article, they talked about how, for, you know, Fiji, I, I'm not quite sure who Fiji was colonized by, but it was colonized, I think probably by the British, but it may have had several different colonizers. And so initially their archives had all these colonial records. Nobody ever came to the archives. Nobody ever used the archives. People really didn't want to know about those records or care about them. But then they started, and also there was a language because there are different languages in Fiji. And so the archivists began to bring in local materials. They began to bring in things that were in the language that Fiji was speaking. They began to bring in cultural things that related to their culture. And people started to come into the archives. So I think a lot of it is about having something to, it's all about, and I think public librarians in particular know this, it's all about having something that people want, that people want to access, that people want to be part of, that people want to be involved in. So this is a, a brief answer. Thank you, uh, Prof. Now there are some comments made as expected where uh, our former national librarian, Winsome Hudson, said not to worry, Prof, soon archivists will outnumber librarians given the focus of the training. I know what she's talking about. <laughs> as, as far as I see it, you know, 
that is a very long ways ahead. And, and, it, and personally, since I, you know, I'm in this space, I do not believe that is a welcome trend either. Because quite frankly, we all need persons who, pub, persons who specialize in published materials. Archivists are not interested in published materials. And regardless of what those published materials form, Max, they will take. So we need folks who are interested in published materials. We also need folks who are interested in the three-dimensional, which is where the museums people come in. Archivists are not necessarily interested in handling and caring and interpreting three-dimensional. So we need equal numbers, equal representation. And um, Ruth is going into the details about the number of librarians taking the archival programs. And James is talking about the migrated archives and the response by, of the British, it's all in the chat. And Winsome, interestingly, I didn't know that, that the National Library of Jamaica rejected the 2016 merger of National Library and, and JARD. For, I would like to hear more about that, um, Winsome, because quite frankly, JARD is still undergoing some changes, which quite frankly, might be worse than, uh, than a merger with, with National Library. Um, and yes, and social media, we could use social media for yes, um, integrating and um, absolutely. There's one more comment before we wrap up this session. Oops. Yes, young people have volumes of accidental archives stored on social media. It's not a formal process, but it's driven by curious curiosity, personal interest, hobbying, and so forth. So absolutely, you have uh, Jeanette fed us well for this lunch um, Ken Ingram lecture. And I want to just bring it to a close as the formal aspect of our lecture or formal sharing of information, discoursing, dialoguing, you know, sitting at the feet of our professor in our presence. We're so grateful <laughs> for your, your time and your, 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 your effort in preparing and helping us to remember Ken Ingram in the way that, that you have done this afternoon. Um, so folks, we are wrapping up this aspect of our program. I want to thank all our participants, Professor James Robertson, um, the, the chair, the program committee for the way in which they plan this aspect of our symposium. And I will be handing over to Dr. Heath just now. Without, prior to handing over to Dr. Heath, we do have a special item, Ms. Jarrett. Is she still here? Yeah. So very much for your patience. We are now awaiting your talent. And the next voice you'll hear after me, after after Miss Jarrett is the chair of our department, Dr. Rosemary Heath. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me on this beautiful platform. So I'm going to be singing two songs this afternoon that really speaks to the entire theme and atmosphere of this symposium. It speaks about accessing your full potential and living to be the very best that you were created to be. Each day I live, I want to be the very best I was meant to be. I'm only one, but not alone. My finest days are yet to come. I broke my heart for the regain. To taste the good, I felt the pain. I rise and fall, but through it all, this much remains. I want one moment in time when I'm more than I. Thought I could be when all of my dreams are a heart beat away, and the answer is all up to me. Give me one moment in time. When
when I'm racing with destiny. Then in that one moment of time, I will live, I will live eternally. I've lived to be the very best. I want it all, no time for less. I've laid the path, but now the chance here in my hands, give me one moment in time when I'm more than I thought I could be when all of my dreams are a heartbeat away and the answer is all up to me give me one moment in time when I'm more than I thought I could be when all of my dreams are a heartbeat away and the answer is all up to me give me moment in time when I'm racing with destiny and oh in that one moment of time I will be I will be moment in time when I'm racing with destiny then in that one moment of time I will be I will be free eternal Get together and feel alright. Let me hear you 
say one love, one heart. Give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel alright. So don't worry, na na na, about a thing. Oh, 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 oh. cause every little thing is gonna be alright. Oh, say don't worry, no, no, about a thing. No, 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 no. Cause every little thing is gonna be alright. I woke up this morning, but I'm a smile with a rising sun. Three little birds was by my doorstep singing sweet songs. Melodies be over and true. Whoa, 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 saying, this is my message to you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I say, don't worry, oh, about a thing, no, no, my Lord, cause every little thing is gonna be alright. I say, don't worry, no, nah, no, nah, about a thing, my, my Lord, cause every little it's gonna be all right. Whoa, whoa. I say, no worry. No, 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 no worry. No, 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 it's gonna be all right, it's gonna be all right, it's gonna be all right. Say no worry about a thing, no, 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 no. Cause every little thing is gonna be all right. No, don't worry about a thing. Yeah, cause every little thing is gonna be all right. Oh, oh, a Saturday morning, na 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 na, it's gonna be alright in the morning, it's gonna, it's gonna be alright in the evening time, it's gonna be alright, I said don't worry, na 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 don't worry, cause every little thing, every little thing is gonna be Every little thing, every little thing is gonna be all right. Is it? It's gonna be all right. Every little thing is gonna. Every little thing is gonna. Every little thing is gonna be all right. Every little thing is gonna be. And every little thing is gonna. It's gonna be. Every little thing on our Every little thing is gonna be all right. She went your weary, feeling small. I'm on your side, and when you need a friend. And friends just can't be found like a bridge over, over troubled waters. I will lay me down like a bridge over troubled waters. I will ease your mind like a bridge over, over troubled waters. I will lay me down like a bridge over.
troubled waters I will lay me Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Oh my word. Let me tell you, that was so inspiring. That was such beautiful singing. Thank Just you. want to thank you so much, Mrs. Jarrett, for sharing with us today. Thank the you, message in each song was so appropriate. And, you know, I'm sure that everybody who was in attendance and who witnessed your performance is of like mind that that was really, really awesome. An awesome end to our three days of being here for the symposium and to the end of the Kenningram lecture. Absolutely wonderful. You know, though, I hope you know going forward that you have just established a long-term relationship with the DLIS and you're going to be tired of us because they say the reward for hard work is more work. <laughs> so, so going forward, I am pretty sure that you are going to be getting a couple of calls from us um, to sing at functions, etc. And perhaps not just the DLIS, but members of other organizations who are present here who will be having functions going forward. To think that you did that a cappella is what is even more amazing, you know? Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, students all, I know that you are all here and ready and waiting for this this, this grand finale where we are going to be presenting to you the names of the two students who have been successful in receiving the DLIS 50th Anniversary Scholarship Award valued at 200 Jamaican dollars each one undergraduate student and one postgraduate student will be the recipients of this scholarship. Now, let me just say, the DLIS has over time tried to assist our students, not, um, well, in a meaningful way. We have just this year, we were able, the start of this year, we were able to give, to help one student who was in dire straits with $100,000 towards the payment of her school fees. And then we were able to help another with about $26,000, I believe it was. So we have been trying to help. And we are we recognize that our students are really struggling. So Jamaican dollars, we recognize that our students are really struggling and any way at all that we find it possible to help them, we are going to do so. Dr. E, so, just a minute please. You actually said $200, I suppose that's why the question- came. I am so sorry. Thank you so much for the correction. <laughs> That was a slip of the tongue. I meant to say 200,000 Jamaican dollars for each awardee. So sorry about that. <laughs> right, so, so we are, um, we were very transparent in the way we went about selecting the two recipients. We formed a subcommittee of the larger organizing committee for the symposium. 
And I won't tell you the names of the members of that subcommittee, but what I'll do is tell you um, the, their professional involvement. So we had uh, an assistant registrar of, of the UI Mona, or DLIS honorary fellow, the DLIS librarian, the head of department and vice, one of the vice presidents of the Library and Information Association of Jamaica. All of us are a part of the DLIS um, anniversary planning committee. There, we use that a, a list of criteria and these are the, each student should be currently registered as a DLI, meaning you can't be on leave of absence. And a, you student should have a GPA 0.0, or if it's a graduate student who would have started the program before we before we started to um, assess grad students with a GPA, applying a GPA that would last year. If you keep for last academic year, you would need to have a, at least a B plus average. The student actively involved in DLS extracurricular activities, be a current member of a professional association, be able to it that in a meaningful way, your financial need, you should never have benefited from financial assistance from the DLIS and should not current benefiting from another scholarship. And so I think those were broad enough, pulling enough, um, applicants. We had a total of 14 undergraduates applying and five graduates. Let me just that the funds will be coming from be taken from DLI endowment fund, which we intend to replenish with pros from this symposium. This is an opportunity, therefore, to all of you who are in attendance today. You would like to contribute to the DLIS endowment through which financial assistance for students is made possible. I am going to invite you to make contact with me at, either by email at rosemarykeith02 at mono.edu.gm. That's rosemarykeith02 at uimona.edu dot j -M. or you may call me in office after uh, Monday of next week at 876-927-2944. 876-927-2944. We assure you that your contributions will go towards a cause because our students are struggling. And if we can find a way to help them, to motivate them, to do whatever, to push them towards that, that, that goal that they are seeking to achieve, I assure you, they will be, the society will be all the better for it. Our profession will be given a push so that we can survive. You don't have to be a library information professional to make a contribution. Just 
you just have to have the desire like we do to ensure that students are helped. It's going towards a worthy cause. Okay, so after having said all of that, let me at this time make the announcement that our students are eagerly awaiting. The recipients are here. I am hoping they are both here. I'm not really able to go through the list of uh, attendees right now. But I am, I am going to start off with the announcement of the DLIS 50th anniversary scholarship for an undergraduate student. And let me just say that I know the students will be excited, but even in that moment of excitement, I will invite them as soon as their names are called to let us see them. Turn on your camera, open your microphone, and feel free to say anything you wish to say to us, even in your moment of joy. Let me also say that this 200,000 Jamaican dollars will not be given to the students in their hands because we know how that goes. Students might just be, be tempted to use it for other things other than um, propelling themselves forward. And so what we're going to do is to ask the UA Endowment Fund to pass, to send the amount across to directly to the student's account so that it will, be, um, it will go towards their school fees. If they are final year students, they will be able upon graduation to claim back whatever is left of it, if anything is left of it. Sounds fair, doesn't it? Fine. So here goes, drum roll. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to announce the winner of the DLIS 50th anniversary undergraduate scholarship. That person is none other than Daniel Phillips. Congratulations, Daniel. Daniel, are you here? If you are here, let us see you turn on your, your camera. She's not here. Danielle, no. I'm going to call her. Let me call Pardon her. Me? Get to her. We'll get You're to calling her. her. Please do. And in the meantime, while Dr. Baker Gardner tries to make contact with Danielle, I will go ahead to announce the DLIS 50th Anniversary Scholarship awardee in the graduate category. And that person is none other than, drum roll, Jillian Tingley. Jillian, are you there? Ah, there she is. There she is. And Jillian is dying. Oh, my word. Congratulations, Jillian. Congratulations. Let us hear from you if you are able to. You can compose yourself first, and then we will. Oh my God, I am so elated at this moment. Um, I started my application twice. I actually, I, I started it. I stopped for a few days. I said, I'm not going to apply because I'm not going to get it. <laughs> I started it again. I stopped when I was about three quarters away. And then I said, you know what, let me send it through. So right now I'm so elated. 
Um, this means a lot to me. I really, I really appreciate the scholarship. I want to thank the LS, the LS so much <laughs> uh, for putting on the symposium. Also, I wasn't there for all three days. Um, the little part that I got, it was great. Uh, really, 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 really elated at this point. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. You are welcome, Jillian. I know it's, you know, it is really overwhelming and I can understand the emotion that is, you know, attached to, to, to this. I'm glad you were able to speak actually. And we are delighted to be able to assist in this way. It is a significant way of marking our 50th anniversary. And you are here at the right time to receive this kind of assistance. Congratulations. Is Daniel here now? No? Oh dear. We haven't found Daniel, so keep going. All right. So, well, I suppose her, her classmates will tell her of her success. And let me just say, as I told you before, there were 14 undergraduate and five graduate applications. And the fact is that only two persons could have been selected. Let me just say to those students who were not selected, be not discouraged. It is our intention to continue to help you going forward in whatever way we can. There's not an abundance of, of, of funds where, where this is coming from. And as I told you, we have to push now to replenish the, you know, the, the, the funds that we have. But, and that is why I'm reaching out to everyone and asking that you all little, little make nof nof, try to be a part of this, of, of building this endowment fund so that we can keep helping our students along. I want to, I want to just say thank you so much to everyone who was a part of the symposium uh, or the, the, the celebration committee because, I yes, I guess, oh, she's here? She, well, she has no internet where she is, but she's on a Zoom. Uh, she's, she can speak via WhatsApp, so I'll allow her to say something. Thank you. Daniel, go Daniel? Ahead. Congratulations. Hello, Hello Dr. Higgins. <laughs> everybody is hearing you, so speak to everybody, please. Okay. Thank you to the LIS for this opportunity and that I was chosen for this scholarship. So thank you to everyone. And <laughs> Okay. Okay, Daniel. You're welcome on behalf of the DLIS. Yes, thank you. So, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. A fine way of putting the icing on the cake. A beautiful experience that we have had for the past three days. And we look forward to partnering with you in a, in a more meaningful way going forward as the DLIS strives for higher heights. And, uh, you know, we, we seek to serve the profession in the best way that we can. At this time, we are going to uh, call upon the Reverend Dr. Glenroy Layla to pronounce blessings on the department. As we go forward, we have done 50 years and we wish to go on and on even beyond our time on earth. The DLIS will continue to grow. And so we ask the Reverend Dr. Glenroy Layla of the Bethel Baptist Church to pronounce his blessing upon the department, after which Dr. Ruth Baker Gardner will bring us the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Heath. Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. Let us pray. Oh God, 
or help in ages past. We acknowledge your hand in the gestation, the birth, and growth of what has become the Department of Library and Information Studies. During this observance of the 50 years of its formation, you have given us the opportunity to celebrate the truth that your hand, O oh God, has guided this department from age to age. We stand in gratitude to you for the work of all who continue to contribute to its growth and development, for the work of the pioneers, the staff, the entire DLIS community, of those in particular who have served faithfully over these past five decades. This department standing for you remain humbled by the contribution it has made to the region, the contribution you have enabled it to make through the many innovations, programs, courses, and training opportunities offered. And especially today for this symposium, where over these past three days, you have enabled participants together to reflect, to celebrate, to plan ways to educate, as well as to innovate. Oh God, our help in ages past, you are our hope in years to come. This 50 years of existence has provided a time of reflection, of stock taking, of renewal as we look to the future. The future in a world that is very different from the one in which it was formed. A world transformed by a pandemic, one that is threatened by imminent climate disaster, and now one made insecure by a war. But you, Lord, remain constant, constant for the world and for this department. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we and this department has already come. And we have this confidence in you that what you have done, you can do. Our confidence and hope is in the future, a future that is in you and because of you. You are our shelter in this stormy blast. You are our sure defense. So give to this department, to its leadership, to its entire community, by your grace, vision and courage and all the necessary resources to those who will lead. And we pray in a special way that by your grace and goodness, you will replenish and strengthen the endowment fund. The endowment fund that has made and brought joy to Daniel and Gillian today, that you will strengthen it to bring joy to so many other persons and ultimately to benefit this region of which we are a part. So we bless you, gracious God, for great things that you have done and for the way that you will build on this solid foundation for the wonderful things that you will do. So God of grace and glory, bless the Department of Library and Information Studies, all who are part of this community, the blessings of God creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with you and with us all now and forevermore. Amen. And so it is my distinct pleasure. Um, Dr. Baker Gardner, before you, before you, you give the move the vote of thanks, I, um, I need to make mention of the fact Dr. Stewart just reminded me because she is the immediate past head of department. She reminded me of the contribution that Liaja um, retired librarians 
has been make have been making over the past um, many years towards helping students to move forward financially. And so we want to thank the members of the retired, the Liaja retired um, section for what they have been doing to encourage them to continue and to encourage others to join them in the bid to do so. Thank you. Dr. Baker Gardner, please go ahead. And so it is my distinct pleasure to bring the curtains down on what has been an astounding three days of celebration with this vote of thanks. Oh, what a time we had. So on behalf of the Department of Library and Information Studies, DLIS, I want to begin by saying thank you to our guest speakers. We listened in rapt attention to Mr. David Drisdale, who so ably opened the symposium as the keynote speaker, reflecting on the past, describing the present, and pointing us to the future. The audience was wowed by his presentation, which took us back to the days of the Star Wars. Professor Jeanette Bastion's call for the recognition of multiple ways society records his, its history is timely. The historical journey of recording and record keeping was instructive even, even as she reflects on the many roles the record played during the period of slavery. I leave today with the following words echoing in my head. Behind the record is the need to record. And who owns the record also owns the story. Gratitude goes to our sponsors for believing in us and in what we do. These include our diamond sponsors, EBSCO Information Service, Platinum Sponsors, Go School for Information and the Broadcasting Commission, and Gold Sponsors, the University of Technology and OCLC. To our stakeholders across the Caribbean who head library systems and professional organizations, your presence has brought the celebration a notch up. As we continue to serve you, we look forward to continued partnerships. To our presenters, words fail to express how delightful it was to listen to each of you. Shared knowledge is indeed a wonderful thing. We leave this conference all the richer for having been together in this shared space for the past three days. To our chairs and rapporteurs, you have volunteered your time and talent to be with us. Thank you. I hope the sessions were as rewarding for you as it was as they were sorry for us. Thank you to Dr. Carmel Ruth Bowen who brought greetings on behalf of the Dean. Professor Robertson, we thank you for crossing the floor to share with us a memorial for Mr. Kenneth Ingram. It was indeed our pleasure to have you. To Dr. Carr, our campus librarian, who took time out to be with us over the three days, we say thank you. Your commitment to the DLIS and to librarianship cannot be doubted. Reverend Layla, thank you so much for praying with us. We recognize that the business of touching lives every day has eternal consequences. We know that we cannot do it without divine help. And so even as you pray, please know that we too have committed to keep praying that God's will will be done at DLIS. To our rapt audience, the symposium would not have been possible without you. Thank you for sharing your time with us. We hope these presentations have given you enough to chew on for a long while. To the members of the planning committee and subcommittee, thank you for the many hours you have devoted to walk in this journey with us. We look forward to working with you on future projects. Teamwork made this dream work. See you all at 60. Thank you very much. Dr. Heath? Yes, Dr. Baker Gardner. I'm finished. We're Ladies finished. and gentlemen, thank you all for being here. And as Dr. Baker Gardner said, see you again in a while. Goodbye. To Miss Bishop, who had a, a, a request in the chat for information, it is our hope to put the papers together and to do a public, a special publication of the Caribbean Library Journal. So we'll keep you updated with that.
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Garland. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations again. Bye. Bye, everyone. Uh, may I ask the host question? I'm interested in rewatch questions. I'm wondering where can I watch it. Uh, will you post it on the Facebook page of the uh, department? Or uh, I want, or is there any way I can watch the lecture? Thank you. Okay. Um, I think, Mr. Dean, the link can be placed on the DLIS website. Yes, we will make the link available on the various social media platforms. Right. Thank you very much. It is indeed a very full, uh, a wonderful uh, lecture. I am from Thailand, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Again. Team, please stay behind. Members of the of the um, planning committee, please stay behind. Okay, that's a hit. Just allowing everyone to leave. So in another two minutes or so. You have factored in that some people might not actually be around their machines, right? Yes. Well, we could close you and want join. Us, you want we, us to go to the other could, room? No, no you could, could just put them out of the room. No, you could just put them out of the room. Who is the host? They're, I'm the host. They're, they're leaving, right, so just, I could just close yeah, you if can you just, want. Yeah, please do. Right, let, me, let me put them out. <laughs> Meet your mic, Doc.